Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to another LSDM Masterclass. So for this, the creative director and founder at ACA Interiors. Um, so for this session, Anna will share her experience, her international experience as an interior designer. Uh, and also talk a little about the project ACA Interiors, which was founded in 2020, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the LSTM masterclasses are online sessions with the length of one hour approximately. So we will have 30 to 45 minutes of conversation and then Q&A. Uh, feel free to, every time you want to ask a question, share your question in the chat box. Otherwise, by the end of each topic, we will uh, ask you to raise your hand and then uh, place your questions so that Anna could get, can share her experience as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for, for joining us. And, and the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you so much for your introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself first, just so you kind of get my background a little bit, and then I'm going to go through the topics uh, for today. So uh, as my father said, uh, I'm currently the creative director and founder of AC Interiors. So this is a project that I've recently started. Um, it's a bit of a side project still, because I still work for another company as a senior interior designer. Uh, this company is called Sintildit and is um, basically an English country home interior design company. Um, so I uh, did my bachelor in Portugal um, in interior design. Uh, I'm Portuguese. Uh, then I moved to London uh, to do my master's um, also in interior design. And uh, while I was doing my master's, I started working for Ralph Lauren. Um, in the home department offering a design service. So we would kind of design properties uh, using the Ralph Lauren products. And then following that, I went to an interior design studio called Cardin Pinetti, where I worked for about five years. Uh, and I, where I can kind of, I kind of grew international, uh, my career as well, because we worked in several projects, not only in the UK, in the US, uh, France, Spain, you know, a bit all over. Uh, and then I did a few months at Kelly Hoffman Interiors, um, which is a very corporate environment. So I did try that for a while. Um, and then I quickly realized that I prefer smaller kind of niche studios where there's a lot more creative um, freedom. And that's where I, I am now. <laughs> so um, that's kind of my background. So today I'm going to talk um, about a bit of the ideal client, um, the kind of design process that I take on my projects, like bear in mind, this is not a rule across the interior design industry. This is something that I think is quite generic that everyone follows it a little bit, but people might call it different names in different studios. And then a little bit of project managing as well. So um, the ideal client, obviously in an ideal world, uh, this is all the characteristics we would like to, to get in a client when um, we have a project. So ideally we want that person um, to need our services. So someone that would come to you and really request an interior design service that fully understands it. Uh, a person that obviously respects and really appreciates the value of those services um, because as probably some of you know the design industry is not seen yet as a essential kind of professional environment people are still a bit oh you're just an artist so this is something that's really crucial especially when you're doing someone's property they really need to respect and appreciate the fact that you've studied for this and that you are professional and that you've been doing this for a long time. Um, and then a person that, you know, takes you on board and really likes you and then obviously refers you to 
their colleagues, their network, their friends, because this is the crucial part of the interior design business is that you can do all the marketing strategies in the world, but the word, the people talking about you to their friends is still the best way to get projects because it's a professional kind of personal experience. And when you work in someone's property, it's a very personal place. So uh, the referrals work really well. Uh, and then the last one is person, a person who trusts your judgment. So basically what I mean by this is a client is always gonna challenge your judgment, but what we need is someone that doesn't spend too much time challenging your judgment, um, which means that, you know, he accepts your recommendations in a way that he reduces, you know, if you spend too much time kind of like um, competing a little bit with your ideas, then this is reduces efficiency and it gets really frustrating. So what we need is someone that really trusts our opinion. Um, in the next slide, uh, this is a quick diagram I did just to kind of explain what an ideal project is. So this table uh, has the four squares, financials, product, client satisfaction, and internal satisfaction. So an ideal project is a project that you can kind of tick all these four boxes. So when I mean financials, it means that obviously you earn money from that project and is a profitable project. Uh, the product is when it's a successful project, so when you're really happy with the result. The client satisfaction, obviously, it means the client is really happy with the outcome. And then the internal satisfaction is you, your company and your team are really happy with the project. So this doesn't happen often that you take all the four boxes. Um, sometimes you might take three of them, sometimes you might take two. And this takes me to explain you a little bit what I mean by strategic client or your bread and butter client. So it's kind of a golden rule because obviously everyone kind of wants this amazing project that you can tick all your four boxes. But sometimes you have to get a project that it's not necessarily what you really want to do and it's not necessarily like what you like to do, but it pays the bills. So that's kind of your bread and butter client is the projects you get. So you get your studio or your business kind of going um, and then they kind of compensate because then you have your strategic clients, which are the clients that you really love, that you really want to work in the projects. But maybe these clients um, don't have the, the same budget that you would ideally, in your ideal scenario would like to spend, but the project is really interesting and challenging. So you would kind of balance your clients between these two types. And that's kind of how you successfully run your business by having different types of clients and always aiming to take all your four boxes. Um, I'm gonna go into the design process. So as you can see, I kind of name it in six stages. And I think most of the studios would kind of go a little bit from these two six stages, they might cut it to three, but you know, I think this for me works really well. So stage one is the brief and client appraisal. So at this stage, you already got the project and you aggregate a quite a quick presentation to show my client where I already like go through the plans and I start arranging the floor plan so we can have this first meeting kind of talking about what they envision for the space, what do I think it works. Uh, for example, I would know kind of the biggest size they can go for all the beds, for example, in each bedroom and stuff like that, so that we can kind of have this initial conversation. I would also add images uh, that would be my first kind of look ideas for the look and feel of the property. Uh, but put together in a way that we can have a conversation about the client's likes and dislikes. Like, does it, is this too traditional? Is this too modern? Like, do you like color? Do you prefer, do you like timber? Do you like stone? So all of this, as much information as you can get to really help you and inform your design decisions for, for the next stage. Uh, then you go into your concept design and this is kind of where you take all this information and you go room by room and you really design the property 
uh, you might introduce some um, 3D visuals, you introduce some samples, for example, for materials, uh, you start looking at like furniture. Um, so you kind of create your concept and I usually do it room by room uh, because I think it helps kind of explain the journey through the property. And that kind of helps you also like make sure there's a continuity within your design. Um, once you get the client's feedback after this stage, you go into the design development, which is kind of like the final stage of a proper presentation to the client. It's basically where you take the concept, you finally you create the final design. Your final design will be very a lot more informative, so you might have more technical drawings just to really explain, you know, space arrangements, etc. Um, it would have a lot more technical information and it would have the final selection um, of FFNE. FFNE is a term that means furniture fittings and equipment and is used to basically describe, um, imagine if you grab a house and you shake it, <laughs> anything that kind of falls off the house is considered FFNE. Um, so anything that is not attached to the walls. Um, however, we do sometimes include in here, like, um, I don't know, bathroom equipment as well and like sanitary wear, um, but that kind of depends on a project. So this is the things that your client has to really pick, like that sofa, that chair, that rug, that light, you know, all of these things. So this is your last meeting that we need your sign, their sign off, your client sign off. Once this is done, the design is agreed, then you move into the detailed design and procurement. What this means is you create your technical package, the package that has every single detail. And I mean, some say this is probably the most boring part of the project because you have to really create loads of technical documents, um, loads of like specifications. I'm gonna show you a little bit of some of them later. Uh, but this is where you create basically all the information you need to send to your contractors, your builders, any tradesmen they're gonna work with you. Um, and the procurement is basically the phase where you start purchasing, ordering everything that you're gonna put in that house. From lighting to wallpaper to sometimes even flooring, you know, everything. Uh, once this is obviously done, you go into your delivery and installation. So. For the interior designer, this is more the stage after the building work is done and where you start delivering everything you've purchased and you kind of supervise the installation of any fitted items. So like your curtains, your um, even your taps, you know, anything that is fitted to the walls. Um, so this is probably like, I don't know, maybe like four to six weeks before you hand in the project to your client, you really have to be probably on site a lot more. So you can really supervise this. And then lastly, and it's a bit separate, which is like styling and accessories package. This is more of, you know, those final touches. So sometimes clients like to have this stage together with like stage four, so that when you hand in their property, it's fully ready to live, like even to the towels, the bedding, etc. Some people like to see the result first and then see what they have or the, what they own they can reuse and then maybe contact you after to see like actually I need a bit more of this I need some artwork um, so that's kind of a stage that I keep it separate but sometimes it makes in between four and five and then perhaps before you enter in the mm -hmm. next part of the presentation regarding project management I would like to ask you two questions. You, you talked about the importance of building a relationship of trust with the client. Uh, and now with your experience, you already have, or I believe you already have um, a very well-known brand because you already worked with, in several projects. So probably you were already referred several times. Um, but when you start uh, working with a client, uh, that you never knew before, that you don't know anything about him. How do you build this relationship of trust? Um, so <laughs> it, 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 I think it's a bit client by client. So sometimes, you know, as I said before, it can be referred as a friend of a client. So the trust is kind of already built in and then you just really yes. have to listen to the brief. So the client will always come to you with very strong ideas of what they want and what they need. Um, so the kind of first conversation 
it's it's quite like a gray area because some clients you have to kind of go with the flow a little bit <laughs> i mm -hmm. think sometimes clients um are asking on that kind of first consultation that like could be a phone call it could be a meeting in person nowadays is very uh, a video call since the pandemic mm -hmm. um you kind of have to give a little bit of information that you're not necessarily getting paid to but to kind of get their attention so you might say oh you have that problem like i've done this before what do you think and you know it's more to kind of just get give them a bit of information so they can see you know okay she's fine like she's not scared of telling me what she thinks um so that's kind of the approach i take uh sometimes there's a brand new client has only contacted me from like a website or you know i saw I don't know, so a, like a project or something. Yeah. yeah. So then I would maybe share some of my um, previous projects, maybe the ones that I think they are um, more connected to what the client is looking for. So I think it, it really depends. I think it's a, a big part of this job is learning how to read people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you really have to have those skills, <laughs> but you kind of build them, I think, with the experience. <laughs> Cool, cool. Um, well, and that's it. And go ahead with the, yeah. the part of the project management <laughs> okay, for, so, for stopping. No, no, it's okay. Um, so this is a very, very important part of the project. So, and I would say that it's a very creative job being an interior designer. Um, but I would say probably 70% of it is being very organized and having quite strong management skills because you do have to manage time, you have to manage your resources, you have to manage people um, and you have to manage your client's expectations. So it's a lot of managing for one person or for a team. Um, so I'm going to touch base on a few topics like client communication, project planning, managing your trade and suppliers, and then a little bit about design fees and invoicing. Um, so in terms of your client communication um how do we communicate with this client how do we understand what we have to do so it's it's, it's quite this is coming from a very personal experience i'm pretty sure some other people do it different ways um but i would say again it would start with an initial meeting probably a consultation it could be over the phone it could be on a video where you kind of take a little bit of the brief and at this stage the clients are very short about what they have and what they need um and that's when you kind of probably start having you know there's a lot of email exchanging more phone calls maybe a per like a, a meeting in person where you take the brief and the scope of work so what is it actually needed sometimes even takes a visit to site to really see the property and see what it needs because the client might think there's only this amount of work or you might think there's all of this amount of work and then you get things actually look you can do this you don't have to like completely renew your property you can reutilize this so this stage is kind of like you're not getting paid you're putting a lot of hours but this is where you're going to get the project um then the second stage you probably it's your fee proposal so you bring all of that in and you spend some time typing in your fee proposal um your design fees how you charge uh where you explain the stages what do you think you need your deliverables like you it might be different from project to project you might need to issue more drawings for one project less drawings for another and you create a time plan and this time plan is basically to explain the client look i go through six stages on your project and i think this is kind of the time it's going to take me and you create a little timeline of when do you think the crucial dates will be this also helps you kind of keep on track and not spend too many hours that you don't need um, and once you have more than two projects or three projects, then you really need to kind of focus on this time plan and, you know, your time plan might be adjusted according to the other projects that you have. Um, then you have your contract signed. And this is the stage where I think you send your first invoice and what the invoice is, if it's a deposit, I don't know, um, a full fee, then it's up to the designer to decide how he wants to charge. Um, then you go through, obviously, the development of the design stages that we've just mentioned. Then you get your project sign off and your FFNE budget sign off. And that's when you start purchasing everything. 
your site work starts, you have frequent site meetings where you might, at the initial, the beginning, you might need to go once a month and then it starts getting a bit more frequent towards the end of the project. And then you have your installation snagging phase, which is what we called, even though the project is done, you might walk around and see a few things that need retouches and this is your kind of snagging phase. Um, and then the project handover, which is basically it's done, ready, and you hand it over to your client. And then I have, again. <laughs> I have another question here yeah. because you were talking about this this phases, um, and uh, I believe that during the the brief and the the, the initial meetings, uh, you get to know more your client, you get an idea of what he needs, what he wants. And then you present the few proposal and the time plan. But in between, do you do some tests? Do you look? Do you share some some look and feel the mocks? I don't know. Uh, to just to make sure that you're in the right way, or you start building your fee proposal without um, having this uh, validation from I think the client. I think the fee proposal would kind of come before. Um, just because if you start doing a lot of work then, or some work, then, yeah. you know, they've got some of your ideas and then they probably don't need you anymore. So I think you can give a little bit on the first meeting, depending on what you feel about the client is, is what her pro the approach and you can kind of read if it's kind of going ahead or not. And then your fee proposal yeah. is basically going to really decide, you know, they're going to look at it and think, can I afford this? Is it worth it? And but I think it needs to be done. It's something that, you know, a lot of designers are scared about these new proposals, but I think it is a yeah. way of like, <laughs> look, this is what I do. This is what you're gonna have after I finish. And this is how much it costs. And I think we have to all learn to be more upfront about this and direct because we need, as the community of designers <laughs> we need yeah. to start putting our foot down and like this is a profession that everyone that we love that we studied for and we spend a lot of time um invested on being better and giving you the best results so yes i would definitely do the, the fee proposal before <laughs> um <Okay. laughs> as i was saying uh is some important tools and rules um obviously be clear about payment terms and the allocated time to your project. And this is not only going to protect you, but you also give some uh, protection to your client as well. Because if you say that, look, it's going to take me four weeks for the concept stage, then it's going to want a meeting in four weeks. So, you know, you have to kind of be very clear about this. Uh, and obviously, you know, all of these things, you probably have to do it like by weeks or by months it depends but you know it's obviously a bit of a hybrid situation but it's good to have clear terms ahead of starting the project uh then one thing i think it's crucial is follow up following up your meetings with um meeting minutes so once you've got that presentation then you've got all your notes then you send to the client after and say look this is what we've talked about please let me know if there's something i understood that is not correct uh, or if you want to add anything, um, so we can kind of go through the next stage. Um, only communicate problems when you already have a solution. Uh, this <laughs> is very important because I've worked with people that really panic and start talking about with the clients about problems that are happening without have no like having the knowledge to say, look, this is happening, but we sort it out. We can do this, this, and this. Um, so I think that's really important. And then obviously always ask for approval. Um, so if there's something that you need to change, I don't know, an item that, for example, is out of stock uh, that you've proposed or it doesn't get there on time, things like this that you think that could um, challenge a bit your relationship with a client, always ask for their approval or their opinion on how to kind of go forward. Mm -hmm. um, get your sign off in writing um just to kind of cover yourself a little bit as well and then the handover should always be in person this is a kind of a personal approach because you can then walk around with a client um and i do something called the property handbook which is basically i create a little book of how to treat for example the fabrics how to treat your taps you know things like that which your manufacturers kind of give it to you i just kind of put it together in the handbook so that the client has all the information to hand it's very nice <laughs> um so when i mean um 
uh, project planning workflow, this is kind of a sample of how it looks like. So when you start a project, it might be a time plan just of your design work weeks. Uh, as you go through, and for example, your builder starts giving you the dates for his installation as well, like when is he going to do the demolitions, when is he going to start installing the new floors, etc. Your your workflow is going to start being a lot more populated and a bit more complicated as well. Uh, but this is a tool that should always be shared between all the design team, um, the contractors, the designers, the architects, if they're involved, everyone. So everyone can kind of keep track of the time and this really avoids any delays um, or any kind of overlaps of things being installed at the same time that you can do and the property. So it's really good to keep track of that. And then at the end, you always update your installation dates as well when your curtain maker is coming, when your furniture is coming, so that elegant, everyone needs to work towards that deadline. Um, about trades and kind of how to manage them. Uh, trades and suppliers are basically anyone that you need to work with you for this project. And I would say like four really important things, the references. So if uh, you know anyone that has worked with them before, if you have worked with them before, uh, accreditations. Uh, in the UK, it's quite important. Uh, you really have, and I think in every country, but in here, they're very crucial about having this massive document before you start a project that you kind of have all the accreditations of every trade that goes into a building site. Um, insurance. Uh, so you have insurance and your trades should all have insurance just in case anything goes wrong. If they don't have, then it falls on you. So you always want to make sure that they also have. And others check their previous work and see if you relate to it and if it's something that what you want to do they can actually do it for you um and then um how do you communicate with your design team so this is where there's a lot of uh, technical documents that are updated as you go and probably you keep updating them until the very last day uh so you have your issue sheets um where you basically is a table of everything that you issued to every person. You have your finishes specification, and I'm going to show you an example, um, which is basically a table showing every finish that you use, um, if it's paint, if it's timber flooring, everything they have with images and references and the quantities and where it comes from, as much information as possible. Um, you need to keep updating that workflow table that I've just shown you before. And then obviously, following up with emails and meeting notes every time you meet them. So this is kind of an issue sheet example. It's quite, this is quite, um, this is probably from an architect, so it's quite more advanced. So you've got a lot of drawing numbers and very long drawing numbers. But basically if it's a drawing issue sheet, you would have the scale of the drawing, the page that is printed, you know, who was issued to, the dates, etc. It's just so we keep track of um, what you've sent. And then this is an example of a um, finished schedule. Obviously, it can be a very easy black and white situation, or it can be a more kind of pictures, all the elements that you include, uh, they are fitted. So it really depends. I've worked in studios that do it very differently. The most important thing is that the information is sent and the builders do understand it. Um, and then my last topic. <laughs> Uh, which normally people are very interested, uh, which is how we chart. Uh, so I've, again, working in different studios, everyone has a different approach to how to chart for projects. Some studios even use different ways of charting depending on the scale of the project. But kind of breaking it down in four, you have an hourly rate, which is um, probably the most common in the design world, where you basically keep track of your hours, and you charge your client for the hours at the end of the week, every two weeks, every month, and that period kind of depends. A flat fee, which um, is more for like long term projects where potentially you what you do is you kind of calculate the amount of hours that you're going to work on that project and then you create a flat fee. And the reason why you would do that is because it's probably going to be a one or two years development of that project and then you can kind of charge per stages. So you won't charge, or you can charge the whole 
see it in advance or you do a percentage so that's really like dependent but when um, you go for a sorry? flat fee sorry sorry Anna. when you go for a flat fee do you have any setup costs first or is it the same um no so it, it again depends on the project so mm -hmm. it would calculate i like to do a kind of a correlation between the hours and the square feet of the property so because i know kind of to me how much it would cost of my time and i kind of know already how to calculate this price but as an exercise i think most people would start with the hourly rate and kind of build from that uh, but then the flat fee i normally do it per stages so every time i start a stage i get a payment um and then but I've, I know people that do like a deposit up front and then you pay the remaining at the end. So it just depends on how every business runs. Um, and then commission and margin is basically anything that you buy to that property that is part of that FF&E. Normally interior design studios charge either a commission, which is basically a percentage of those items, which is gonna cover all the time that is spent looking, searching for them, organizing deliveries, any problems that are a result of those orders, or you have a margin, which is normally the suppliers give us a trade discount and then people just charge retail to their clients. Imagine if a, um, a supplier would give me 20% discount, I charge the full price to the client and I retain the 20%. So there's two ways, none of these is I wouldn't say one is wrong and one is right. It just really depends on the studios. Uh, and then lastly, invoicing, I've already mentioned. Um, again, you can do as percentage or you can do per stages. Um, it really depends. It's kind of up to every individual. It works very differently. Um, it can be an 80% upfront, 20% at the end of the project. It just really depends. So there isn't a really a rule for this. It's just different ways that I've experienced professionally in all the different studios. And that's it. <laughs> and now we can open for questions from our yes. audience, but I would like to start me again with yes. another question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there, um, or what are the tools you usually use for the product management? You show us this timeline and all the specification. Do you use any platform and any software in specific to um, yes. manage your team and the project? Yeah, so uh, recent, well, Excel is kind of the basic of everything. So a lot of studios do still use Excel for some of the documents that are issued. Um, but uh, there's uh, uh, Trello. I don't know if you guys know what Trello is. Yes. Is, uh, kind of a board thing. So Some like, of our students already use them as uh, well in the design courses. Yeah. Perfect. So that's kind of what I use to share information with the team. And we kind of keep a to-do list um, by areas or by rooms. Uh, it depends on who is the person managing the project. Uh, but mostly we do Trello to kind of project manage internally. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the kind of workflow, I still do it in Excel, just because I've kind of already have the template, so I'll just reuse it for the project. But there's loads of, I've worked in a studio works Monday app, I think it's called mm -hmm. Monday. Um, and there's another software called STMAC, which is kind of to, uh, uh, to track the budget, but it's designed specifically for interior design. Um, yeah, and that's it. I think that's the one. Okay, what about your experience? Because you work as a senior designer at Sims, but you also have your own project, ACA Interiors. So uh, what is the difference between Anna, the creative director and founder of ACA, and Anna, the senior interior design, on your daily basis? Um, so currently my daily basis is uh, from uh, nine to five. I'm the senior interior designer. Sometimes it gets a bit longer depending on the deadline. Um, and then on weekends, evenings, mornings, whenever I can fit, <laughs> I'm the creative director and founder of my studio. Um, that's kind of how I plan my day. Uh, hopefully soon it would be more of that side and less of the uh, nine to five. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, and I keep everything separate, like very separate. So I wouldn't kind of work 
in one before finishing the other I kind of do keep my times otherwise it could get really messy <laughs> well we have a question here from Alisa Cormichina uh, how many customer adjustments are included in the initial fees in each stage of the project how many sorry how many customer adjustments are included ah. so in between the initial fees how many times yeah the, the uh, revisions yeah yes. so <laughs> i would normally allow for two revisions but when i say two revisions means that for example if i do a flat fee um for a project that is quite long and it probably doesn't take it's a full remodel of a property I probably allow for two revisions, but when I do two, it's basically I probably calculate the hours that it takes me and I multiply by two because you might not have a full revision of every room, but you might take a little bit of time to nail one specific room. Um, so that's kind of what I've allowed to two revisions. Did you already have the experience of having a client that asked you to review everything? No, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> thank God, no. <laughs> I was just curious about this because it is what, as you said, it's um, you need to read the signs of the the, the client and and yeah. uh, kind of understand the mood and the, the needs and and also the expectations because sometimes they are dreaming about a project. Yeah. So one and in real life, it's um, slightly different. Yeah. One yeah. really fantastic tool we have now is Pinterest. And that's one of the things I ask at the very beginning, which is, have you started a board for your property? Do you want to do it? If you have, can you share it with me? And even though Pinterest is kind of an algorithm that not if, doesn't work amazingly for someone that is not um, like looking for something specific. So if you look for an image, then it's going to show you like all the images that are kind of, you know, related, related yeah. to it. So it's not... So if the client really likes a, I don't know, a staircase, then probably the next staircase is not going to give them the same impression. But it might be that he only liked, I don't know, a little detail of that staircase. So once I get that, I, if, if I have those images, I always take it to that first brief and appraisal meeting. So we can kind of like, what did you like about this? Is it the whole aspect? Sometimes I had clients saying, look, the only thing I liked was that fabric on that chair in a massive living room image. So, you know, it really needs, you need to really kind of get this conversation going and like ask about what is it exactly that you like here because you can give you the wrong direction. Um, so yeah, those questions are very important, yeah. Uh, I don't know if the participants want to ask more questions, but uh, I have one more um and it's related about the soft skills you were saying the importance of communicating and negotiating uh, this was a, a thing that you were uh, developing throughout your career or did you feel the, the the need to invest and do some kind of training in this to, to develop those skills is it um, mixed between both i feel like i was lucky in a way because of the work I did at Ralph Lauren, I had customer, that kind of customer service experience um, that I was kind of like forced into by the job. Um, but I feel like it was a very valuable experience in that way because you made me feel a lot more comfortable about understanding what, like reading people and giving my opinion. And because uh, I was kind of selling, you know, furniture for a property so I wasn't like just giving my opinion on a shirt so it was it was quite uh I think a school for me to be there <laughs> it was a really valuable because I kind of give a little bit of that and then with experience when you start going to meetings with clients obviously the directors would kind of be the main talkers in those meetings but you learn a lot I've learned a lot from just being present in listening to the seniors yeah. kind of talk and understand why did they mention that why would they just talk about this like why are they changing the speech now like suddenly and i feel like oh okay they've read that the client didn't like this approach so they're kind of like changing it completely so it's quite interesting to work um i think it's very crucial in a design industry to get experience from businesses they already built and settled and learn from seniors that have been working for years because I think it gives you a lot of benefit and you learn a lot from just listening and watching them. 
Mm -hmm. Cool. We have another question here, which is, uh, in your opinion, uh, what additional education for an interior designer is the most beneficial? So is it, for example, design, management, marketing, project management? I don't know. Anything else? What you, what you believe could be uh, uh, added value to, to the training of an interior designer? So um, I think a bit of both. So while I did my bachelor, it was very interior design related, but it wasn't ready to work. Basically, it was it was good to create a project, but it didn't give me that project management side of it. So I did a short course on uh, business management for interior designers, which helped me a lot to understand this side of the business. Um, and then I would say additional to having any university um, school on this I think it's quite important uh, to learn the software it's what I would think that is the most beneficial to do externally from because some courses do teach you the software but not to the depth of what you need to know so I feel like I've done that as well I went and outsourced the courses there's loads of it online and stuff like that but you can really like develop your skills because when you go to a studio this is what it's going to make you stand out from your colleagues is that she's really good at this software we need her to kind of work on this project so I feel like because I have that I stepped up quite quickly and I really started working on amazing projects while I was still a junior because I had the software skills so having this background like you did in design then trying to specialize and have more of that knowledge in specific tools yeah um cool cool uh and Alice, Alisa, Alisa, it's also what master degree would you add to oh, master if you degree? Wanted to do, I see. <laughs> ah. um, I feel like if you want to do your, if you want to create your own studio and you want to work on your own, definitely benefit from um, management, marketing kind of um, masters, definitely, because it's a lot of management in the job and when you go on your own like when you work in a company you have someone to do everything but if you go on your own you have to learn a bit of everything so it's really good to kind of have that and i think it would definitely add to it like design marketing and management is kind of like the ideal <laughs> scenario <laughs> cool what about the projects you have developed so you have been in ralph lauren and kelly then now sin uh you also so have an experience as a tutor in a, in a design, uh, I don't remember by heart the name, at the British Institute of Design, is, is that it? The British no. Academy of Interior Design, yeah. So yeah. that's, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a similar LS, like LSTM school, so they do mostly online, uh, but they have tutors, professionals from the industry that do a tutoring session um, once a week. Um, where we talk a bit of more like this kind of things, like the professional side of it. Um, so a little bit of what I did today. Um, and I do that for the students where we take them through technical drawing. So most of the work is online, but then we offer this um, in presence. Uh, so that's the only thing I do is I go there and I talk about my week, basically my experience. experience. And, what it's yes. <laughs> and they learn about it like you yeah. did when you, when you were junior and you had contact with some senior designers as well yeah um what about do you feel any change between because you have been working in this area for for quite a while now uh do you feel difference um in the last 10 years because all of a sudden and after covid we all went digital uh did you felt any difference between what was interior design uh, work uh, 10 years ago and now? Does this um, relationship is more digital or? Yes, absolutely. I would think not only from the pandemic, but for the, like London is kind of a crazy interior design hub that I do not understand at some stages. Like we work from here to like the whole world. And I'm sure there's interior designers in all the cities that we work for, but for some reason it's a very strong hub here and we have i've i've worked in projects in like qatar and uh france and then america so like everywhere and because of that reason and obviously the pandemic that just made this even stronger which is it's a lot of digital work it's a lot of 
Zoom presentations and sharing documents. Uh, sometimes I had not even time for a like before Zoom, we would share things digitally and then just have a phone call. I'm like, can you can you see the page, this page? And you know, it would be but I mean Zoom made our life much easier, I have to say. <laughs> but yeah, it's a lot of it became very digital. I remember my first meetings would be in person and we put everything on a table and we print and the all the materials and the materials yeah. and we will do all of this. Now most of my meetings are sharing a screen and sending the samples ahead of the meeting so the client has them with them before we start talking. Um, that's more of what's happening nowadays, I would say. <laughs> What about, uh, and this will be the last question because we are almost reaching six o'clock. Yeah. Um, if you could share what is, or what was the most special project for you, uh, um, the one that has a very special sure. meaning for you. Yeah, sure. So I think um, it was a chalet I did in Mejev, Me in, um, sorry, Saint-Gervais-le-Bain, which is near Mejev in France. Firstly, it was my kind of first project as a senior designer. So it was kind of the one I took over as project manager, creative, everything. Uh, obviously supervised my the directors, but it was kind of my first full on project from start to finish. Uh, so that just made it very special. And then because it was abroad, um, there was a lot of management behind scenes of like finding contractors in France that we could, that would speak English so we could share quickly information. Um, it's not very easy sometimes in yeah so that was that was actually a tricky one then we managed to get some italians but then uh, we had a one member of staff that was italian that could speak to them and then he resigned so then we lost that conversation as well so then we had to go and find a british uh, contractor that was living in france to help us with this because um just made the communication much easier uh and then it was a lot of managing at distance so the only time i actually went there was for the final installation and it was uh, my team and three trucks of stuff and we were hoping that the house was in the state that we could actually just install things obviously this never happened so it was a full week but it was very i mean i love those installation weeks i think they're really challenging and i love kind of making it happen uh, so i think that was kind of my special project Definitely. <laughs> do you go? Do you go on site even in projects like the one you were referring as uh, the one in Qatar? Do you? Uh, do you no, go there? It depends. It depends. It depends on the. Yeah, depends on the client. But for the installation, normally the whole team goes. Uh, for meeting, it just depends on what stage it is. Sometimes, if we have architects, then the only architect side goes. It, it just depends on the stage of the project and. Uh, this is obviously in more corporate environments, but yeah. So nowadays it's mostly by um, Zoom. <laughs> cool. I don't know if anyone has any more questions. I believe not. If not, I would like to thank you, Anna, for joining us uh, for this session. It was very interesting. Uh, and invite you all to, 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 to stay tuned because we are starting to to have this weekly master classes and on on odd topics as well that's inter that are interesting for not only our design students but also for our marketing students so thank you all and see you next week thank you Anna. bye, -bye. Thank, you. thank you everyone <laughs> bye